It all started in 1869 with Swiss biologist Frederick Nietzsche. He was trying to isolate proteins from pus to understand fundamental properties of cells, like you do. And he ended up isolating something that was not a protein, but it had a lot of phosphate. He called it nuclein. But in 1889, German pathologist Richard Altman renamed it nucleic acid after finding that the molecule was acidic. About 50 years later, in 1919, biochemist Phoebus Levine was studying nucleic acids and isolated nucleotides. He determined that the structure of a nucleotide was a phosphate bound to a sugar bound to a nitrogenous base. About 10 years later, 1928, it was the height of the Spanish flu and they were desperate for a vaccine. British bacteriologist Frederick Griffith was trying to make one. And to do that, he was studying a bacteria called pneumococcus, which causes pneumonia. He found two strains, one smooth or S strain, which was lethal to mice, and one rough or R strain, which was not. After many failures and mice, Griffith prepared an injection of the lethal S strain, which ordinarily would kill the mouse. But before he injected it, he exposed it to heat, which killed the pneumococcus bacteria inside, but this time did not kill the mouse. So Griffith had one more cocktail to make he mixed the heat-killed S strain with a live, non-lethal R strain and injected it in to another mouse, but the mouse died. So what do you think happened? Something must have transferred from the smooth strain to the rough strain to make that rough strain lethal. But what was it? At the time they knew it had to be smaller than the bacteria. Now we know it was none other than DNA. The process of altering a bacterial genome by exposing it to foreign DNA is called bacterial transformation. These findings by Griffith showed that traits could transfer from cell to cell. In this case, traits transferred from the smooth bacterium to the rough, allowing the rough strain to become smooth. Despite what Griffith discovered in 1943, scientists still didn't know what transferred between these cells to alter their traits. At the time, the predominant theory was that it was protein. It was at this time the Canadian-American physician Oswald Avery, who believed it wasn't the transfer of proteins, but something else entirely, was continuing the R and S strain experiments. But this time, Avery added in a process of elimination. He removed proteins, he removed organelles, but still the traits transferred. That is, until he removed the DNA. Once he removed the DNA, the smooth strain was no longer able to transfer its lethality to the rough strain, but convincing the world that it wasn't protein wouldn't be easy. It took another study from Alfred Hershey and Martha Chase in 1952. They were studying a type of virus that infects bacteria called a bacteriophage. The bacteriophage lands on the bacterium and injects its DNA into that bacteria. The bacteria dies, but not before making many more copies of the virus. While they may look like little robots, viruses are capsules filled with DNA. Hershey and Chase labeled one vial of their bacteriophages with radioactive sulfur, which is only found in the capsule, and the other with radioactive phosphate, which, as we know, is high in DNA. They exposed the bacteria to one of the two viruses and then isolated them. What they discovered was that the DNA had transferred and the capsule was nowhere to be found. For the discovery of the mechanism, how viruses replicate and their genetic structure, Alfred Hershey, Max Delbruck, and Salvatore Luria won the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1969. Martha Chase was not even nominated. And when Alfred Hershey gave his acceptance speech, he did not even acknowledge her contributions. Even in this modern age, when you search for information on Martha Chase, websites refer to her as Miss Chase, 
or her married name, Miss Epstein, when in fact it should be Dr. Chase because she had a PhD in microbiology. Around the time that doctors Chase and Hershey were looking at whether or not DNA transferred traits, Erwin Chargaff was looking at the structure of DNA. In his sequencing of DNA from a lot of different creatures and tissues, Chargaff found that no matter the species, two things remained constant. First, the amount of thymine always matched the amount of adenine. And second, the amount of cytosine always matched the amount of guanine. This became known as Chargaff's rules. The early 50s saw loads of debate about the structure of DNA. It was then that Linus Pauling, American biochemist and chemical engineer, had the idea that DNA was a triple helix and most of the scientific community thought he was right. But in 1953, molecular biologists James Watson and Francis Crick were so desperate to figure out the structure of DNA, how it came together, how it explained Chargaff's rules, that they were literally taking cardboard cutouts of the nucleotides and trying to fit them together like puzzle pieces. That is, until they saw an image that changed everything. This image came from English chemist Rosalind Franklin and New Zealander biophysicist Maurice Wilkins. They were performing X-ray diffraction experiments on DNA. When they did those experiments, they would shoot X-rays at the DNA. Wherever the X-ray hit a structure, it would deflect. This led to the creation of two images, one of which showed something that looked like an X. While this kind of looks like the X-Men symbol, it actually showed that DNA was a helix because helices always look like an X when you're using X-ray diffraction. And this particular X-ray diffraction pattern showed that it wasn't just a single helix, it showed that DNA was a double helix. If we look at the DNA double helix, there are times when X-ray shooting through the helix would have interference from the other strand making it look like there's a gap in the signal. With that sort of regularity, those gaps could only occur if there was another identical helix shifted by a regular amount. Basically, the two strands were crossing and the gaps seen in the image were the points at which they crossed. This proved that DNA was a double helix and not the triple helix as thought by Pauling. Using this image, famously called Photo 51, Watson and Crick combined the work from previous century to determine the structure of DNA once and for all. The Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 1962 was awarded to Watson, Crick, and Wilkins. If you think there's an obvious omission, you're correct. Rosalind Franklin had passed away four years earlier of cancer from the X-ray diffraction experiments and was not awarded posthumously. If you want to read more about the contributions of Rosalind Franklin and other amazing female scientists, check out the link in the description below. Before we bring things to a close, let's recap everyone's contributions in two categories, heritability and DNA structure. In the category of heritability, Griffith determined that something was passing between cells that altered their traits. Avery and Hershey and Chase discovered it was DNA that transferred traits from cell to cell. In the category of DNA structure, Frederick Miescher isolated nucleic acid. Phoebus Levine determined the structure of the nucleotide. Chargaff determined how the nitrogenous bases fit together. And Franklin Wilkins captured photo 51, which depicts a structure that is a double helix. Watson and Crick finished by putting everything together and publishing the final structure. And there you have it, 100 years and countless scientists to determine the structure of DNA. Not bad for a phosphate, a sugar, and four nitrogenous bases. If you like this video, be sure to like and subscribe so you see the next one when it comes out. See you next time.